Welcome to the Powercast with Charlie Johnson. I'm one of the world's leading fitness and transformation coaches. I'm going to be providing you with the tools to build your ultimate body and mind. So absolute pleasure today uh, on the Powercast to have Chris Collins uh, on from Mudo. So Mudo are a company who we are now working with at CJ Code who do uh, genetic testing. So absolute pleasure to have your time today. So thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you for having me. I uh, look forward to it. And explaining what we do, so that'd be good. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's, um, it's a fascinating new world with science and technology and like how this can be implemented into sports performance and helping people like build muscle and burn fat. So maybe give us like a brief like 60 second intro into like who you are and maybe what uh, what Moodoo do in like a brief brief paraphrase. Yeah, yeah. so Moodoo are a DNA testing company. We test for base genetic code. And we also do epigenetics, um, and epigenetics is when we look at methylation. Yeah. Uh, methylation can change over time. So the things that you do in your lifestyle, whether that be exercise, what you eat, where you go, your pollution levels, etc., we analyze that as well. So we give you a base breakdown of your DNA, and we also do testing for epigenetics, which can be done multiple times throughout the year, and throughout your lifetime to see how things are changing. Based on that, we can give you diet recommendations, nutritional information, um, exercise and training ideas, uh, all based around both DNA and epigenetics. So in terms of the testing, it sounds like layman's terms, but we're very too sciencey because it goes over well over everyone's heads. How does it essentially work? So for both tests, you spit in a tube, basically. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. So once, once the spit's in your tube, once the spit's in the tube, it will carry some of the cells from inside your mouth uh, and, and the cells inside your mouth have your entire genetic code in. So we can use that to basically get all the information from there. And then uh, in terms of the information that comes from uh, the genetic coding, what sort of information comes from there? What, what, what sort of uh, like knowledge can be taken from that? Yeah, so obviously once you've mapped the, the genome out, you can basically look at certain aspects which are correlated to say being more uh, susceptible to certain diseases so that's what like the nhs will do with your genetic code you can look at certain aspects which um, basically show you uh, nutrition deficiency potential so vitamin d potential deficiency vitamin a um, and all these are based around certain genes so certain mutations in certain genes mean that gene may not be working correctly and uh, therefore you may not be doing something inside of your inside your body which it should be doing um, and that, that could be transforming better keratin from like carrots and peppers into vitamin a in the body for example and therefore you have a higher risk uh, of being vitamin a deficient especially if you're vegan or vegetarian and don't eat meat which has normal retinol within it already and um, so things like that can be all based on just dna on your epigenetic side of it the epigenetics will look at the methylation of a gene and that methylation of what multiple genes we look at uh, basically means that you are either getting more of a gene or less of a gene based on the amount of methylation uh, on that. So you may want more of a gene in certain circumstances, which means the gene is uh, um, being utilised a lot in the body, or you may not want want that gene to be being utilised a lot in the body and therefore have less of it. So some have positives and some have negatives. And the methylation can be altered based on your lifestyle. Okay, and like in terms of like external factors like your environment, so like... I guess like pollution levels where you live in terms of how much natural sunlight you have yeah. and things like that, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those things about well, it's somewhat in your control, but if you have to work in a so if you have to work in London, you have to work in London, right? And then um, that may be affecting your pollution levels. But things which are more in your control, like the amount of exercise you do, um, the amount of stress you have, for example, uh, how you respond to stress, I should say. Uh, and diet that you eat, um, all that can be under your control, and that may affect your methylation states of certain genes. Cool. In terms of uh, the results that come back, do you see quite a lot of any common patterns with anything, even in terms of like uh, ethnicity or regions or where people are from? Yeah, sure. We do see some. Obviously, when we started, we tested um, a lot of sports people. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people who are interested in fitness and health in general they were doing the tests and we found that uh, in, in genome population studies, um, which are done not in our company, but in say other, other companies which do it and the NHS might do it, genes which, uh, or gene variants I should say, which are, are rarer or less, less common, are actually more common in this population that we test. So it, it could be that the people who are into sport, for example, may have been into sport from a young age, 
So they were good at PE at school, for example, and then they took that further. Um, and therefore, they may have been good at sport when they were younger because of these gene variants that they have, which are considered uncommon, but they're actually common in the pool that we test. So um, we basically isolated a group out of people who are good at sport and they have the common gene variants. What sort of gene variants would there be? Is there anything in particular you look at? Is it in terms of like muscle fiber types or anything? Yeah, so so, some genes do um, affect your muscle fiber typing, uh, but obviously your environment probably has the biggest impact on the type of muscle fiber types you can have. Um, As such, if if you're going to run marathons every day, your muscles are going to adapt to that. Uh, if you're going to do powerlifting every day, your muscles are going to adapt to that. But the potential for your muscles to adapt to an elite level may be dictated by your genes. So if you had a whole load of people trying to run a marathon, there's someone who's going to win, even though they're all training a marathon, and that person may have the genetic advantage uh, to acquire more slow twitch muscle fibers, or they may have genes which affect their VO2 max, for example, or their lactate threshold, um, which therefore means that they have the slight edge in that account basically their body has a higher capacity to improve almost like a higher basically. ceiling of where you hit yeah basically that's basically what genetics are genetics are, are our ceiling right um some people's ceilings may be quite low um for example if you have genetic diseases or disorders you may not be able to ever get into sport for, because you have you know disability based on that genetic disease but most people don't have rare genetic diseases but they do have genetic ceilings as such you know which you, you uh, say county level you may not notice at national level you may not notice but when you come to worldwide level then therefore you start to notice that there are these differences even though you're all training the same all training to the highest intensity that you can train um it doesn't matter because that ceiling still remains in terms of from a, from a health point of view is there anything like particularly when people obviously get these results come through they should be looking at from like a longevity point of view or yes yeah definitely knowledge? um on the DNA side alone, you have loads of vitamin potential deficiencies. So you have vitamin A, like we spoke about before. Um, a lot of people have turned vegetarian recently or gone vegan recently, which is great because they're incorporating more fruit and uh, veg into their diet normally. However, by doing so, they may not know that their main source of vitamin A will come from better keratin. And then if they have certain gene variants, which means they can't utilize better keratin, better, better keratin into um, vitamin A in the body, um, they're not going to get the correct amount of vitamin A. Our meat eaters, if they eat meat, they'll get vitamin A directly, so they don't have to convert. Um, so when we look at the genes which affect that, for example, we look at the genes that affect your vitamin D, and it's the same sort of complex of how your body utilizes vitamin D. Uh, we look at um, the B vitamins, for example. A lot of people can be deficient in vitamin B, and um, one of them is MTHFR. It's a gene that uh, basically looks at uh, looks at folate in particular. And uh, people who take folic acid, for example, they may not be utilizing folic acid correctly and they should be taking something called methylfolate instead. Um, folic acid is the man- man-made version, isn't it? Yes, correct. Yeah. And some people, people, yeah, yeah, people can't convert that if they have specific gene variants. So it basically allows for better personalization of the supplements that you take. Instead of saying, oh, I'm going to take a multivitamin to cover all my needs. Um, you can pick and choose the vitamins that you need because a multivitamin, in essence, will um, underdose you on things that you do need and overdose you on the things you don't need. Um, and therefore, by having knowledge on your background, your both your environment and your DNA, you're better to utilise certain supplements to basically fill, fill in the gaps, if you like. So no, it's interesting. I get my uh, blood work and things like that done a lot of the time. And the same with. Um... I have to add more methylfolate into my diet, like from a supplement point of view, even with taking like multivitamins that contain it, it's still not enough because my yeah. body needs a huge amount of it, obviously. Um, so it's fascinating when you start to break things down that people think you use a multivitamin to cover all bases, but that's like a, a general supplement that's for everyone. So if you weigh a hundred kilos and the product's designed for someone who's 50 kilos and you're a fast metabolizer, then you're going to need more, even just because exactly. you're your size. Exactly. So yeah, and that's, that's, that's using the environment. So your age, uh, your weight, um, what you do in your lifestyle and your DNA together to therefore make really good personalized decisions. Um, and that's the best way of, you know, it'd be cheaper as well, probably. Yeah, you know, save money. <laughs> yeah, well, so. um, in regards to epigenetics, I know a lot of people have questions in regards to what that actually is. Could you give us a brief rundown with, with, in terms of epigenetics? 
Yeah, sure. So we have our DNA codes. So when you're born, you get uh, mum and dad genetics and they mix together and make you. And that's sort of the foundation level. Okay. And um, once that's done, most people would accept that it's fixed, if you like, although you can get mutations within that. Okay. And a mutation isn't epigenetics, it's something different. But mutations are fairly rare and difficult to target. And um, epigenetics, on the other hand, is methylation. Uh, without trying to get too in depth into it, it's basically where a chemical will attach to a gene site and that will change the way that gene is used in the body. So that you might get more gene or less gene based on the chemical which attaches to it. So um, it acts in a way like a mutation. So if you have more of the chemical attaching, you might get less of this gene and therefore the gene is not working as much in the body. And that may be a good thing. Uh, or it may be a bad thing. It depends on which gene you're looking at. Okay. So, for example, um, there are certain genes which uh, become more methylated as we age. So they become less. They you get, get less of the, the gene. Now, that correlates really well with our, our current aging. Okay. And people who live longer appear to have um, less methylation of these genes. So if we can track that, we can basically say you're aging better, if you like. Yeah. Okay, so instead of going by time, uh, which it really just is man-made and it applies to everybody, we're going by personalizing it to one person. So we can say you're aging better based on the things that you're doing. Is it by looking at the length of your telomeres? Telomeres, is that right? Uh, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not telomeres that, we, that we're looking at here. Yeah. The length of telomeres was something that people were very interested in and still are. Yeah. Um, and that's basically as we age, we lose telomeres until we die sort of thing. But it's um we believe if we just, people used to believe that you're becoming mortal as such you know yeah. aging mortal if you could stop that from happening but it's only now really believe that that might add on 20 years to your life if you could stop it so um there is still a lot of research into it obviously um but we look at the genes which we know for a fact are uh, having an effect on your age and um, so your ability to hear well for example the graying of hair could be one of them. Your eyesight, which you know could be degrades over time. All these genes which affect these areas, um, they have certain methylation statuses, and we can look at those. And by looking at those, we can see if what you're doing currently in your lifestyle is having an effect on it. So, for example, say you smoked all the time, you drank all the time, you didn't exercise, you lived a really poor lifestyle, and you had a well. We, like an epigenetic age, if you want to call it an epigenetic age of, say, 40, but you're really 30. And we said to you, look, stop the smoking, stop the drinking, you know, exercise more. And anyone could say that, right? And you could say that'll make you healthier, but you couldn't track it. You know, you wouldn't know that's making a difference. You, would, you might feel a bit better after a few months of doing that, right? But you wouldn't know for a fact because you're actually still aging, right? You've become 30, 31, 32, 33. But when you took, took another epigenetic test, the epigenetic test might come down from 40 down to 30. Yeah. So you've lost 10 years by doing that. You've gained 10 years on your life in a way by doing those changes. And we can look at that in a test. So you're measuring how beneficial the exercise, the diet is based on the test. Right. And now a lot of people, you know, they, they don't know that they don't know they're ill, but they are ill because what happens is that you, you don't feel ill, like if you had a curve, right, you're getting sicker, 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 until you get to a point, and then you start getting symptoms. But it's only when you start getting symptoms do you people know that they get, that they're, they're ill, right? So you feel fine, I feel fine, I feel fine, but actually you're getting ill, right? With the epigenetics, we're measuring this, this bit here, yeah? So instead of you getting symptoms and dropping off the side, we're saying, look, do something now, and bring it back down again. Before it almost goes to be on the, the point of no return. In a way, yeah, the point where you actually know you're sick. Yeah. I think, uh, obviously, what's going on with the world at the moment, the coronavirus situation is probably incredibly relevant to a lot of people, I think, at the moment, to be, as, like, this is a tool to optimise your health alone, like, let alone talking yeah. about building muscle, burning body fat or anything like that. From a health point of view and longevity, uh, it's probably more vital than ever. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, the coronavirus is it's a virus. Um, it's something people are going to catch and genetics will play a part in that um, so you will see some people who are very young dying from this virus and they may be genetically susceptible to this, to this virus um, 
obviously the epigenetic side of it and the testing and stuff won't have any impact on this. Um, but when it comes to long-term illnesses, um, you know, your diabetes, your heart disease, uh, things like that, then epigenetics certainly will have an impact. Um, but when it comes to a virus, if you eat well, stay safe, wash your hands, be hygienic, those are your best chances really to not get it. In terms of obviously testing with this, is there anything that would flag up showing that you could be susceptible to something like that? Um, some of the genes we look at do have associations with disease. Okay. Um, we don't routinely give out um, medical diagnosis based on that, and no one, no one would, really. Yes. Um, the, the susceptibility, like it depends on the disease, but some genes may give 1% susceptibility, you know, an increased risk of 1%, and some genes obviously give 100% if they're a complete genetic disorder. Right? So you've got a whole wide range. And I would say that every single disease ever has some genetic component to it, um, whether that be 0.01 or whether that be 100%. Um, but we don't give that out because in reality, there's no point telling someone that they're at high risk of a disease if they're just going to sit and worry about it, especially when it's a DNA problem and there's nothing you can do about that, that pure DNA, right? So um, there's no point, in my opinion, doing that unless there are medical treatments out there that help. Yeah, this is a way to resolve it. Yeah, exactly. Causing more anxiety and stress than is probably needed. Yeah, if you're going to say to someone, oh, you're going to get, you know, Alzheimer's when you're 50 and you're 25, now you've just spent 25 years worrying about getting Alzheimer's, aren't you? Yeah, you've got a countdown timer, haven't you? Exactly, and that's, that's, not, that's not good for anybody. No, 100%. 100%. Um, so like, in terms of some of the more relatable things with the testing, how, like, once the information's come back, how do you guys interpret that in terms of putting it through to like, like actual uh, information that can then be utilised? So in terms of like the genetic testing that comes back in terms of like a muscle fibre type, how do you interpret that into terms of what sort of training would be recommended for people and things like that? So we have an app and the app simplifies everything that we do. So you'll see the genes we look at for a certain aspect and for like say muscle fiber type, we look at muscle power and muscle stamina. Yeah. And um, on, on that you'll see the genes and it will tell you basically on a little slider how gifted you might be towards yeah. gaining those types of muscle fiber. And that's basically how we do it. But we take lots of genes and we weight these genes in power based on the amount of research out there and the variants you have. And then if your number adds up to, say, 12 out of 30, you will have one result. If it's 30 out of 30, you have another result. And that's basically how you see it. Have you ever seen, have you, what's the most impressive results you've seen? You seen anything interesting? Uh, I've seen some interesting things. Um, we, yeah. I mean, work with Eddie Hall. Yeah, Eddie Hall, for example, he, he's one of the most interesting people, actually, because Eddie Hall has um, yeah, the gene called ACTN3. And ACTN3, years ago, used to be the sports gene. So you had to have a certain variant in this gene. Um, it, 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 we call them SNPs, right? They, and in this SNP called RS1815739, you have to have a certain variant in that, basically, to be good at power, okay? And that everyone was like, oh, if you test that gene, you'll find out if you can get fast twitch muscle fibers, et cetera, right? Well, I think it's safe to say that Eddie Hall um, has got fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, you know, world record deadlift, for example, world record axle press. Um, he's a strong guy. And um, he didn't have that gene variant. Um, mm-hmm. So it's really weird because everyone in the past thought that was the one gene you had to have, right? So um, he hasn't got that at all. That almost comes back to the nature versus nurture debate in, it, <laughs> in that respect. Yeah. And we, we, don't, we don't ever look at one gene, basically. We all look at multiple genes to make, that make an outcome. ACTN3 is one of them. Now, if you took Eddie Hall out of the picture, the majority of people have got the sports gene who are really good at sport. Okay? So we look at other powerlifters, like Tom Stolman, for example. We have multiple other powerlifters on our, on our books who have got that gene variant, and it's really common in powerlifters okay to have that and it's really common in sprinters but Eddie Hall hasn't got it so it's not a 100% rule that you need to have certain genes to be good at certain sports and that's why we take into multiple uh, genes for example to make a decision and also we take into account epigenetics as well you know your nurture what are you doing and is that affecting those genes that's fascinating in terms of um like 
results. How, in terms of, I think, turnaround time is about four weeks to get the results to come through. And yep. then does that populate onto the app system you guys use pretty much straight away? Yeah, so as soon as you do a test, you will uh, download the app. Okay, and then as soon as the test results are there, the app will update you, and then you have your results. Because this is something we're rolling out with all of our clients to try and uh, obviously improve the quality of the, the training that they have and the information they provide to try and make things even more bespoke and tailored. Um, what do you think is like the future of where this is all going to? Because obviously this is developed very quickly in terms of probably like the last few years. Like you said, people like you could do this 15, 20 years ago, they'd probably think you're crazy, like on a mass yeah. market sort of thing. I mean, it's probably 10 years ago when it started. And then in those days, it was, like I was saying, the ACTN3, they tested one gene. You would do a test, you have one gene tested, and that would say, you should be power, you should be stamina. And um, obviously we know now that's not true. Um, it's come a long way since then. So I believe development-wise, we'll be looking at more research into certain genes and what they're doing and why it's affecting someone. Um, and also the epigenetics, I think, will take off in a massive way. Because I believe that uh, with a measurement such as epigenetics, people will be far more motivated to maintain um, their exercise regimes are far more uh, you know motivated to maintain their health and eat correctly because they will have something telling them you are getting sicker even if you don't feel it yeah um like longevity i think is, is everything in that respect i think everyone's looking for and it's just been yeah thrown around a lot more at the moment um in terms of like the kits from a we've talked obviously from muscle building strength side of things do you guys test in terms of like fat mobilization or in terms of like if you're more likely to be obese or anything like that or have like yeah we, we, we have we have got those variants in there so we have got like obese, the obesity genes if you like um and we have got the you know type 2 diabetes genes in there as well um but they're more for information purposes rather than you know it's it's not it's not a prediction to say that you are going to be obese you know that is environmental and it's one of these things that it may increase your risk by a few percent you know to be obese so you can't ever say, oh, it's in my genes. You yeah. know, it's not. It's, you know. It's not lately. Some people might be able to eat two cakes, but you yeah. can only eat one. Yeah. And that's the difference. And try not to eat any cakes is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in regards to that, I think it would be quite interesting. Do you guys ever do that on like a, like the results based on like um, a like geographical location to see like in terms of if that varies? Yeah. So our, the, the research that we use, um, based on certain um, aspects. So because we, we're worldwide, um, we give power to certain genes. So if that gene has been researched in multiple ethnicities across multiple countries, we may give that more power in the algorithm because we know it's affecting you know, human, humankind as such. If it's only been tested in one specific area, it may not have very much power in the algorithm, and that's how it works. Um, we obviously have a, a multiracial amount of people who have done our tests now we have tested people from who are living in india malaysia uh, in all across europe and america so uh, we have a lot of people doing the test uh, so it's fascinating how much sort of detail and information could come from that and um, so to sort of wrap, wrap things up because i want to keep you too long in terms of the process what would you say to anyone who's interested in using the product in terms of uh, the testing in terms of from a like a health optimization point of view and maybe from trying to like optimize their performance. I think obviously health optimization is no shadow of doubt of how much benefit there is there for people. Even just have like a, a moving score to almost, I think make people conscious of what they're trying to achieve and like longevity. But um, do you have any parting thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we have got the epigenetic age, we'll call it biological age. And yeah. I think that's the number that a lot of people use in the epigenetic part of it to really measure uh, their, op their optimal health, I suppose, you know, it's the one figure which says everything about the person, right? If you want to look at complete sport, I would base it on what you do in sport, you know, based off your lifts, based off your sprint times, based off your marathon times, etc. But if you want a health score, the biological age is definitely uh, the one to look at. And um, if you go to an office and you test everybody in the office and they've all got their, their biological age, suddenly everyone's motivated to like exercise. Like, oh, I'm going to knock five years off this, you know. Especially if they're 40 and it comes back to like 75 or something, you know, they're, they're really trying to, you know, get motivated. So it is, it's powerful to say, to tell someone who's 40 years old, you know, you're, you're 60 according to your DNA.
And I think it's one of those things people need to be given a bit of a rude awakening sometimes because you're only otherwise, as we said, going to get that rude awakening when you go too far beyond the point of no return, you end up having a heart attack or yeah. diabetes or something, which is a serious issue. And now you've got a problem that's probably going to be irreversible to a lot of, a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, if the hardest thing to prove is prevention because it's never happened, right? Um, but it's the best way to save our healthcare system. So the best way to solve our healthcare system is the hardest thing to prove. Yeah. And, you know, we all know that exercise is good for us. We all know that eating correct is good for us. We all know that being stress-free is good for us. But with the biological age, at least it gives you a number, a measurement to go off as well. Yeah. You know, so it's not just, you know, oh, I know it's good for me, but I don't know, I, don't know, I feel fine. Well, you, you might feel fine, but you're not. Yeah. Inside, you're not. So I 100% agree. That's some very wise advice there, I think. Yeah. Um, all right, we'll start to wrap things up there. So anyone who's interested in potentially using the kits and getting some application from our side of things, uh, if you hit the link below, you can apply to work for myself and the team and we can also get you set up with Mudo in terms of genetic testing and epigenetics and we can try and get your uh, biological age down so you can try and get you living longer. Um, thank you very much for today. Chris, really, really appreciate your time. Perfect. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. We'll you guys soon. So um, stay safe with the current situation regardless of what's going on. And uh, yeah, hope you all right, take care. Thank you, thank you. Bye now. Ta -ra. Now that was an absolutely killer episode of the Powercast. Hope you guys absolutely loved it. Now I want to fill you in something I put together which is absolutely incredible to help you not just survive during this quarantine, but actually thrive and come out of the situation in your best shape ever. So I appreciate a lot of people are really struggling at the moment in terms of knowing how to train from home, knowing how to stick to their diet when stuck in the house. There's ladies in lockdown, guys stuck in the house. There's a lot of issues going on here. And I wanted to come forward to help you guys and girls come out of the situation as a success. Now, what I have done is completely revamped my world famous Shred Nate and Sculpt Nate programs. And what's even more exciting about this is I've given you 77% off on the price of the program. So normally it costs £149 or 200 US dollars. Now you can sign up for just £37 per month or 45 US dollars. And what's better, you can actually lock this price in for the rest of the year to so see a new training program, a new diet every eight weeks. Now the new versions of the program are fully home workout based, just using your body weight and some basic bands. These will get you the normal world famous results that you get on Shrednate and Sculptinate, so you come out of this situation in the best shape ever. If you'd like to get involved, please click the link below in the podcast notes or drop me a message with any questions. We'd love to have you not just another client of Shrednate and Sculptinate, but another success story.